So the next three verses look a little shorter, but they're actually a little bit more complex. They have a, what we call a second class condition uh, in them. Uh, so we'll sort it out piece by piece, especially grammatically. So the context is important. Uh, we were just told that the, the John, uh, John is reminding his readers, you knew that there was going to be an Antichrist coming, but guess what? There are already a whole bunch of them. So we know that it's already in the last hour. Now we're going to find out who these Antichrist people are that John is talking about. It turns out they're not devils, they're not uh, some false religion from outside. It's false teachers who've gone out from the community itself that John is addressing. There were people who have gone out because they weren't really a part of them, they weren't really uh, speaking truth. They left and that's how we know they were actually not true representatives of the gospel, but contrary to the gospel, contrary to Christ, and therefore anti-Christos. They were antichrists. So the antichrists were false teachers who went out. That's what we're going to see. So it starts out that way. They went out. So this is from Erchomai. The heirist is Eophon. This is one of three verbs that occasionally, instead of having the O-E-E-O-E-O -E 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 pattern over here, which is what we'd expect on a second aorist, they change to alphas. First aorist, second aorist verb, first aorist endings, according to nouns. So here we see an A, where we expected alphon, third plural. So they went out, ex erchomai, they went out from us. This is just reduplicated. I mean, it's repeated. Wouldn't have needed both of them. You could have dispensed with either of them, but it works fine to include it both places. They went out from us, but not they were from us. So this X is, is, is used here to show moving away from, but this X is used for they weren't belonging to us. They weren't from us. They weren't one of us. Uh, so I, I think the paradox here, I mean, it, it's a paradox to say that they went from us, but they weren't from us. But the idea is the reason that they went out because they didn't really belong to us. They weren't one of us. They weren't of us. Okay? They didn't truly belong. So they went out from us, but not they were from us. Because, for, if. So here we're going to get this second class condition. If you remember how we studied this, it's going to have any indicative verb in the first part, the protasis, if they were from us, but they weren't. If they had been. That's the idea of a contrary to fact condition. In apodosis, you have to have the word on, and you have to have what he calls a secondary tense. I think he told us it has to be aorist or imperfect, but it can actually be perfect as well, and that's what this is. This is a perfect, um, in fact, it might even be a pluperfect. That's a tense we didn't even learn. It's one step farther back. But the idea, the, the translation is going to be exactly the same, because the point is, for if they had been this, they would have done this. That's going to be the translation no matter which tense you use. So, what would have happened if they had been of us? They would have remained with us. This is from mene, or meno. Here's the reduplication. Me, then men. For some reason, this... Eta is a lengthening contract vowel that isn't even there. I think this verb does that actually in a couple of its tenses. And then instead of a K-A, we have a K-E-I, which I'm pretty sure is the mark of a pluperfect. Uh, it's the, in English, we would say, I have eaten. That's perfect. But if you say, I had eaten, that would be one step farther back. That would then be a pluperfect. Uh, but again, it doesn't affect the translation. The point is you have to have a secondary tense, and then you translate this as a contrary to fact condition. If they had been from us, which they weren't,
then they would have remained with us, which they didn't. Okay? Now, the only reason we know that they don't and didn't is because of the construction. A on in the two tenses. Uh, or in the, sorry, the two parts of the conditional. If that's still completely mysterious to you, look up the four different classes of conditionals in nouns, chapter about 35, and look at second class conditional. All right, but now here we're gonna have to assume a whole phrase that isn't repeated. But they went out from us. But the reason they did is, is the implied thing, but they went out from us in order that. So what tense, sorry, what mood do we need after a hina? This is a subjunctive of purpose, but the reason they went out was in order that phanerothosin, it's from the verb phanero, o, omicron contract, the theta, and the theta eta is the aorist passive, and this is the subjunctive ending. We have to have a subjunctive after hina. So, aorist passive, it was manifested, or it was revealed in this context, but in order that it be revealed, and again, so we can't push the tense, the time frames, with the subjunctive. So, but in order that it would be revealed that not they were from us, that is, belonging to us. Now, this word pantes, they weren't all from us. So some of the teachers that John would have uh, in his mind belonged and some didn't because some of them taught wrongly and therefore they're revealed to not truly belong. We're going to find out soon what they were teaching wrongly. Uh, this, this letter is going to turn in the direction of, so what constitutes a proper confessional uh, statement and what's heresy, what's wrong belief systems. So not all of them are from us, from among us. So they went out in order that it would be revealed that they didn't really belong to us. Where's the proof that they don't belong? They left. Why did they leave? They didn't agree, because they were wrong, okay? And you, now this is you by contrast to they. They were not from us. You, however, you have a chete, a chrisma. Notice this is the same word as Christ. So it's a chrisma. So the Christ is the anointed one. A chrisma is a, a I was going to say christening. I suppose it's related to that. Uh, so you have an anointing. He's referring, of course, to the Holy Spirit. You've been anointed by the Spirit. You have an anointing from the Holy One. There's no noun, so this is then again a substantival adjective. You have an anointing from the Holy One. I suppose he means the Holy Spirit has anointed you with gifting, or maybe God is the Holy One and he's anointed you with the Spirit. Either way, it's the Spirit who enables us to discern truth from error. You have an anointing from the Holy One and you know. Now this is the subject. In the, if you know this text well from the old King James, it said, and you know all things. Not possible, because that would have been panta. You know everything. We don't know everything. But all of us know. We don't know everything, but we all know. So we all have within us so the ability to make discernments by the Spirit as to what's truth and what's error. So this is a nominative. All of you know. You all know. I think there's a textual variant. It's not that the King James translators couldn't read Greek. It's that they were reading manuscripts that had the wrong word in it. So all of you know, but not all of them did. And so that's why some of them went out. Not, I am writing to you because you don't know the truth. Now notice again, this is the 
errorist. Literally, we would have to say, I didn't write, not I wrote to you, except he's almost certainly thinking about this letter. And he's talking about his own present writing. And so he uses what we call the epistolary errorist, the errorist that registers that the writer is putting himself into the time frame of the readers. By the time they get the letter, he will have written it. So he says, I wrote, so that when they read it, they agree that he wrote it. We don't do that or do it very rarely in English. It was pretty common in Greek. So I didn't write to you or I am not writing to you because you don't know the truth, but because you know it. So he's, he's not saying you don't know the truth and I'm informing you. I know you know. I know that you know. I want to assure you that you know because I'm encouraging you to realize why the others left. They left because they didn't know, because they were wrong. And we stayed because we know. So he's going to encourage them in their common faith, not try and bring them to a common faith. He's acknowledging what they already know. Now, he's going to say later on, you don't even need any teachers because you all know the truth already. He doesn't mean that in the literal sense that the church never needs any teachers at all. Everybody gets their private instruction from the Holy Spirit. I think he's just concerned about the fact that there are teachers that they've recently experienced who are teaching all the wrong things. And if they just trust what they've already previously learned, you don't need a new teacher telling you new things. You need to retain what you previously already knew. Presumably they learned those from teachers. Uh, then you're gonna be able to stay with the truth. Okay, repeating, not I am writing to you because not you know the truth, but because you know it, her, except it's feminine, and what else do you know? You know that every pseudos, every liar, not is from the truth. Actually, I think it's every lie. Check your vocabulary. I'm a little insecure right now, and I'm not going to bother to stop and check. Every lie isn't from the truth. Everything that's false isn't coming out of that which is true. So he's putting a very clear separation. Those who went out, the Antichrist, they were teaching falsehood. The believers, the ones who've been anointed, the ones who are listening and paying attention to what they've previously learned, they're staying with the truth, and therefore there's no danger that they're going to end up in 